and so we have to report the money and budget. Yes, we got a half hour run. I think there's an interesting answer. Uh, this which chapter I skip before the monetary policy chapter? It's on the test. It's on the test. Yes, right here. Um, maybe y'all remember from high school government class, civics class, yeah. somewhere along the line. Money has money is a tool. I think I, I've tried to mention that. Before. Money is a tool. Uh, we don't work for the money. We work for things that the money can do for it. Well, the money in an economy does four different things. Number one is that medium of exchange. It's the thing that we exchange so we don't have to do the barter system thing. So we don't have to go around saying, uh, my, sink is, my sink is leaking and I do taxes, so if I do you taxes, will you do my sink, fix my sink for me? We don't have to do that exchange. Like there's people at the beginning of the semester. Yeah. So it's the medium of exchange. It's putting things off. It is our unit of account. That's how we measure things, how we keep score. How we how we measure when Paley's lending me something, how she knows that she's getting paid back that much or more because we're denominating it in terms of money. It is how we store amount, store value. Paley has extra money that she doesn't need now. She does she didn't have money. Haley, right now. Haley works 40 hours a week and she ends up with leftover money at the end of the week. So if there was no money involved, well, what would end up happening? She would work however many hours a week and she would need to work in order to get the products that she needs to get and then she's done. Right? No need to work anymore because I'm going to work and get nothing in return. But how many of you are going to do that? Work for free? Yeah, pretty much. Since my wife gives my paycheck, I, that's pretty much me. That's Yes, yeah, so you're pretty much in that way. <laughs> but it's like if you earn, if you do extra work, you can get that extra reward and hang on to it for the future. You don't have to get it and spend it now. And so money is a tool that we use for this. It's big deal. And then it is our standard of deferred payment. Haley gave me a hundred dollars. She gave me Benjamin, and then I'm going to come back and I'm going to give her a pile of rocks. <laughs> well, there's a hundred of them. And then she comes and starts taking her rocks and throwing them at me, right? And I'm like, thank you, I didn't get any big ones. Right. <laughs> but it's when we're deferring, when we're postponing payments, what is it that we're going to be paying back? That same thing. It can't be the, you know, she lends me a banana and then I'm going to give her a banana three days later, or what kind of conditions that banana is going to be that I'm going to give her? It's going to be kind of rotten, right? Yeah. So we can't use bananas as a currency because they rot. We don't use leaves because they're everywhere, so how are they going to have value? You need to have something that's kind of standardized that we can use to measure, to keep account, something that's going to hold value, maintain value, not dissipate, go away, and that kind of thing. Gold. Gold was what we used to use until a few hundred years ago. It's finally really only been the last couple hundred years that we've gone to paper currency before that. You have coins. Coins are the thing. But the coin had to be minted in the amount of metal that was worth however much it's supposed to be. And then they said Nixon changed like, the value of money compared to like, how gold. Oh, the, you know, we're completely off the gold standard, but you know, we did spend what, what's back our currency has changed over time. Wayne Jennings Bryan in his Cross the Gold speech was talking about, I referred to that earlier this month. Uh, that was back 100 years ago now. Yeah, we'll go. About 100 years ago now, they were debating about going, staying on gold standard versus going off of it. The money supply, we've kind of talked about it, is how much money is there out there? And if people are willing and able to lend, what money is available for people to, generally what we look at is money available for people to use, to borrow, to use. I don't have any money, I don't have any extra money, I don't have any money to add to the supply to help grow the economy because my wife's spending it all, right? Haley has extra money that she's willing to lend to grow the economy. She has extra money. She could invest it in a business on her own, but she don't want to invest it in a business on her own. She's going to lend it to somebody else, let them invest it, right? The money supply is how much money people are willing and able to lend at different interest rates. Also, use word savings there. Your bank is paying 10% interest on the savings account. 
Are y'all interested in putting money in a savings account? Yeah. If your bank is paying one tenth of a percent interest, are you interested in putting your money in a savings account? Well, I still am. Don't bother. Yeah. <laughs> Some of us still are, but just it's kind of almost not worth it. If you have money in the savings account and you're not planning on spending it for at least six months, get it out of there. Put it in a CD, money market, something, anything. Do you know how much uh, the um, interest rate on a credit union savings account might be in full? They're going to be high, but they might be. Uh, we've got our money in a uh, credit union, but it's maybe a percent. Yeah, honestly, I don't pay attention because it's so ridiculously insignificant in the moment. This, this. I don't pay attention because my wife has all the money, so I don't care what bank she has it in. I, mean, I have I have used an ATM card. I, I tried to use an ATM card once in the last 15 years, and the machine refused me because I didn't know what the PIN number was. And, oh no! And, no, they, no! I think I knew the pin, but they're like your card is expired, and it's like come inside and do the paperwork to get us to send you another ATM card. I'm like, no, no. <laughs> Just send me a new card every few years, whatever. So, we know. Anyway, so, how much money is there? And if interest rates are low, we're not willing to borrow. We're, we don't have much that we're going to be willing to save. And saving is lending. Which I think I'm not sure I'm going to get to this. I told you, saving is lending to the bank. It's lending the money to the bank. That the bank is going to do what? With it? Lend it to the customer. Haley has extra money, but Haley isn't interested in talking to people. I've got extra money. Hey, uh, Connor, do you need extra money? And then she's got to investigate his background to think what are the odds are that he's going to pay her back. And okay, well, maybe not. Matthew, do you need any extra money? And okay, how much you willing to pay? Let me check your credit. She ain't got all that time. So she ends up, I'll give it to the bank and I'll let the bank do the headache of doing background checks. I'll let the bank go through the headache of doing collections. And then I share a profit with them. And then you get higher interest rate. <laughs> and so that's, that's what the whole, what the banks are doing there. But how much money we're going to save is ultimately how much money is available to be lent. That's the money supply. And we can measure the money supply. This is just cheap, cheap, cheap crap matching section questions. That's why I'm like, there should be questions to be stolen from here. But we measure generally the money supply in two measures, M1 and M2. Money one, money two. M1, this is currency. There's green paper, green pictures of presents, right? The currency plus balances and transaction accounts. What's the transaction? You buy. You're buying something. So what is the transaction account going to be? You're taking money from account. What account do you take money out of the spend? Your money account. Your checking account. You have money in the checking account that pays even less interest, but why? You don't care because that money's only going to be in that bank for a few days because you're going to be using it to pay your bills, bills at the grocery store, to pay your cable bill, your phone bill, and that kind of stuff. That's the M1 money supply. Cash and money in the checking account. But the M2 money supply, take this M1, cash, and money in the same checking account. And it's adding savings accounts and money market accounts to it. Because how easy is it for us to spend money in our savings account? It's pretty easy thanks to ATM machines, right? It used to be, back in the day, back when your parents were your age, your money was in the savings account. You had to go to the bank, get your money out of the bank. And the bank opened at like 10 a.m. And then they closed at 12, and then they reopened at 1.30, and then they closed at 5. So you only had a couple hours in the morning, a couple hours in the afternoon. And you actually had to physically go to the bank, fill out the form, and get your cash. Doesn't that mean they were high interest? Interest rates were higher because it was harder for people to get the money out of the savings account. So the bank knows well, it's easier. We can lend more of this money because it's harder for the customers to come and get it. Now that people are spending their money more, they can't lend it out. Yeah. Now it's 
so easy, to get, it's almost as easy to get money out of a savings account as it is a checking account. So the banks can't trust that money in a savings account is going to stay for any length of time. So they can't lend anywhere near as much of it. So that's why your savings accounts right now don't pay much interest. Yeah. Because they're only going to pay interest on money that they can turn around and lend. And if they can't lend it, they ain't going to pay interest on it. Because of ATMs, that kind of stuff, that is what, and then, oh, it's getting you worse with a little smartphone thing where you can just walk up and beep and it's automatically taking it out of your account. And then paying, swiping with your debit card, chipping debit card thing, thing there in the grocery store, Walmart, it's too easy to do it. So they can't lend it, so they ain't paying interest for it. So savings account interest rate is fairly low checking account. The only difference between savings account and a checking account is you don't actually have to physically go to an ATM. You can actually pull out a piece of paper, write that little piece of paper, write the check. How many of you actually have a check book? No. I have a couple checks. Four of you. Okay. How many of you actually write a check that doesn't end up getting immediately stuck in an envelope and mail somewhere? So none of you check books that can leave the house, right? Okay. So there pretty much is no difference between the savings account and the checking account for most people anymore. Right, it's, just, it's an account and we're paying with plastic in some form or another. So pretty much this is all gonna be, it's all pretty much the same. And so the M2 is just a little bit broader definition of the money that's available to be used. So this is money available to be used. Because what money goes in your checking account? Well, it stays in your bank account for more than three days. So money, that money that after taxes have been taken out of your paycheck, and you pay your bills, right? And then this is what's left for you to do whatever with. And maybe you'll leave it in savings for that quarter of a percent interest. Maybe you'll lend it to somebody. Maybe you'll spend it on much worse on drop, right? But this is the money, this is the pool of money potentially out there that could be or could be used. Think about how small that is. Who can I pick off? Wait, Bob, you say you make ten dollars an hour. How many hours a week do you work? Oh, 20. Twenty hours a week. So you make mean you make two hundred dollars a week. How much money do you have in your pocket right now? Zero. <laughs> Zero. Okay, Jenny, you raise your hand. How much money do you work in a week? How much do you make a week? Nine and a half dollars about twenty-three, twenty-four dollars. Oh, so you're you bring home a little over two hundred dollars a week? How much cash do you have on you right now? I'm cash. None. I got five cents. Yeah. Remember that cash bump, that money multiplier thing we talked about? There ain't that many pictures presents floating around anymore because we don't use them, right? We're using the plastic stuff now, but that still is money, right? It's ones and zeros instead of green pictures of presents, but it's just our money is in a slightly different form now. But it still is money. Just because I'm not carrying cash doesn't mean that I am broke. Because I'm married, that's why I am broke. The demand for money is going to be how many, how much money people are willing and able to borrow or hold. Hold is the textbook word. Textbook word. I'm going to hold it. Interest rates are low. I'm not going to be bar. I'm not going to be lending my money out. I'm going to be holding onto it or spending it. Right. If interest rates are low, maybe I'm going to borrow money and I'm going to use it to buy something else. Hold and borrow just where the other was to lend and say, but just the whole concept of I'm holding the money. Like you kind of are. I'm not going to lend it to anybody. And I won't, you know, can I hold your money? Yeah, no, you can hold my money. I'm good. You just admitted five times in the last 10 minutes, you got to ask holding your money. And of course, I just realized that, okay, yeah, I probably should have asked Jenny how much money she has for Bobby. So, obviously, y'all know neither of them have any money, so there's no need to try to mug either of them in the parking lot, okay? When class is over, no violence is necessary because it's just a waste of time. So, okay. But what do we need money for? Three things. Questions on the test. Number one is transaction demand. Transaction is what? Uh, receipts, buying stuff. Buying stuff. Did, did I do a little? No, I didn't. Okay. I thought I did a little. 
sub rule 23. So transaction demand, this is the money we use for spending. You need money to pay the credit at the gas station. You need money to pay your phone bill, right? You need money to bribe your politician. Whatever you pay, bribe the cop to keep from hit the cop writing the ticket you got pulled over this afternoon, you know, you are about to meet. Precautionary demand. What do you think that is? Or like emergencies. Emergency. This is caution. In case of emergency, this is cash that you have on hand that you don't plan on spending. If you plan on spending it, it's here. This is money that you have just in case. What you should have, that $20 bill that you keep folded up and tucked behind your driver's license that you wallet. Back in the day, you actually were able to stick it in your wallet in your driver's license. And there's a little folder that you can sleep in. Yeah. But you should do that. $20 bill, or nowadays probably maybe 40 you keep a couple 20s tucked in there, so if your car does break down at the side of the road or something and the tow truck comes or whatever, what, you can pay the person. So they're not gonna, so they'll fix your car or whatever and they're not gonna get mad and tow your car away and then you gotta pay a few hundred dollars, right? Or, or your car dies and you gotta take a taxi in order to get home because it's the middle of the night somewhere. Or you're out partying with your friends and y'all were doing a bunch of drinking and then some people got angry and you're like, this and you're walking out and you don't want to walk all the way back to your home or apartment or something like that, have a little bit of cash in your pocket somewhere. Don't plan on spending it, but have it just in case. That is a need for cash. I don't have it anymore. I just, but that would be what that would be. Okay, I, I kind of do have this. I've probably got about $4 of cash in my desk door in my office in case I go into it and I'm like, Open my fridge and there's no sun drop and it's a few minutes before class begins. You can go to and, right. and I can go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Rather, that's the last thing I do. I go with a Dr. Pepper would be my next trip. But I've got a few dollars in my desk drawer here. I've got a few dollars in my desk drawer in out in Kizo. But I'm talking like three or four dollars and then change every once in a while. I come in here, I got to change my pocket and I just jump in a little dump it on the thing just in case I need to buy a drink. That is precautionary demand. The third one, speculative. What is speculative? What is the root word speculative? Thanks for that. Speculate. What do you what do you know speculating? You're thinking. You're guessing. You're thinking ahead, finish your sentence. Think ahead, yeah. Yes. You're kind of gambling in a way. You think I'm holding on to this money. Because I'm going to get a better deal in the future. This, some of you in early November, I've got money for TV, but I'm going to hold on to it because I think that TV is going to get cheaper than Black Friday. So I've got money. I'm not planning on spending it now. I'm going to hold on to it so I can spend it later. I'm going to hold on to it looking for it. Well, it's not Christmas gift. That's, that's still kind of here. But this certainly, I'm expecting a better deal in the future. Or I'm going to take this cash, I'm going to convert it into pounds because I think exchange rate is going to switch over and improve, and then I can cash it in a couple weeks later. And then, is that a beer bottle? Okay. So I sort of my eye and I'm just like, Connor is hard work. And when you just talk about it, good. I do have $20 in the wallet. So hey. Okay, good. But this is for people that are going to do some, invest, some not necessarily investing, but it's a little bit of gambling, whatever, hold on to it. I'm, I think the car is going to be cheaper next month. I think the TV is going to be cheaper next month. I've got the money, but I'm going to hold on to it. So those are the three uses that we're doing with money. Money we spend now, money we spend later, money that we hope not to spend. Right? Those are the three reasons that we use money. So, the money market is a place where the price of money is determined based on the supply of money in the bank. How many people like Haley have extra money? And she's like, I have it, I don't need it. Let's see if there's some suckers that are willing to borrow from me and pay some interest. And the interest rate she's going to get is going to be partially based on 
Well, how many other people are out there saying, I've got extra money and I don't need it. Let me see if there's any suckers who want to borrow it. Give that to me. Compared to the people like me, how many people are like me that are like, I don't have enough money, I need some extra money, so I went to my will and pay. If a bunch of people say, I need money, very few people saying, I have money. Supply of money is lower, the demand of money is high, and interest rates are going to be high. high. If, however, there's a lot of people with a lot of extra money and nobody's saying, I need extra money, then you've got a bunch of people with extra money that they need to find a lender for, interest rates are going to get low. That's how it's going to end up getting the term. And overall, you and I as borrowers, you and I as lenders, you and I as workers, and our businesses are the ones that are determining supply of money, the demand for money. So it's you and I that are determining overall what the interest rate is going to be. The Federal Reserve, we talked about them last week, they're going to be tweaking it a little bit. Because what they're going to be doing is tweaking things to adjust the amount of the supply of money. Tweaking the rules to determine how, because hey, we ain't going to be lending money out to be the bank, let the bank lend it out. Federal Reserve is going to be tweaking the rules about what it is that banks can do as far as how much they're going to be able to lend out to tweak that supply of money to tweak the interest rate. Did they tweak it last? No, they didn't. Uh, it, I, I was mixed up. They, their meeting is for another week or two, but the Fed chairman was, he was speaking at a, and he's doing a big speech, and people were like, okay, that's going to be in for what they're thinking in the future. But, so I was a little bit confused. And the USMCA has been signed by the head of Canada, Russia, and the United States, but it hasn't been approved by Congress yet. So. Did I say Russia? Yeah. <laughs> we were like, we're going yeah. to <laughs> uh, Mexico, Canada, United States, whoever we are. Just, I don't know who I look at. Yes. Uh, well, that's a thing. No, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> okay. The interest rate is a price for the use of money. If I want to use Bailey's money, I got to pay the interest rate, right? That's the price of money. I got to pay the interest rate. Or you can see somebody that can charge you. And anybody that's any kind of smart, anybody that's taking an economics class is going to charge interest because that money is going to be losing value in the future because of inflation, inflation and nothing else. Unless you have a lot of money. Yeah. yeah. Unless you borrow money from somebody that's insanely rich that doesn't care, or you borrow money from somebody that you are very closely related to that loves you very much. Yeah. Otherwise, you pay an interest. But if they really love you, they can teach you that harsh life lesson and they're charging you anyway. That's what I was about to say. My dad teaches me all the time to make the interest. You know. Yes. Still does. Wait, do it. <laughs> so, I already talked about this. The equilibrium rate of interest. Well, don't write this one down. It's just the interest rate from when the equilibrium where supply and demand meet. Where supply and demand meet, you get the equilibrium, and that's it. Interest rate. This. All right. Visual learners. The more people like me that need money, it's going to increase the interest rate, right? The more people like Haley that have money is going to do what? Lower the interest rate, right? Overall, that balance between the two of us is going to determine what the interest rate is going to be. Oh, wow, we did. I missed this one. So, Boom. Chapter and a half. One day. Mic drop. Any questions on any of that? Okay. I know this is fairly quick. And what we're going to be doing Thursday, chapter 23, Consumption Savings and Investment. It's a pretty quick thing to do, so it'll be okay. So tell us what, but I'm not letting you off with a quick one. What? A slide on chapter nine or something. Uh, it started on, I don't know. Just a long scroll. It was on deflation, dangers, measures of inflation, CPI, EPI. It started at like, really, it's going to start at like 22. That's probably where I'm going to start at. Wait, you're not scrolling. Sure no. Okay. So, oh, just. We started doing some random stuff the other day while I had a woman. So I'm not going to start the next chapter. I'm going to do some more random stuff. Yeah, it's more of a cast like that. Yes. Okay. Um, just for fun of it, I'm going to look at this as of 2011. The census they do, that's the 2010 census. The next census says it could be until 2020. In some places, they've got the 2015. They do an estimate there, the middle thing.
thing. They really it takes a while for them to compile everything. Uh, but I pulled this out because it shows stuff that you can't really compare to. But like the U.S. population, 2011 was 311. The 2010 was 308. So we're going up by like what's that? A couple three million people a year. Sure. So right now we're going to be 320s. Kind of that. What percent of them are under five years old? Six and a half percent. What percent are 18 years old? And of course, so it's under eight. I mean, under five. 23.7 percent. Person 65 and over. I'm not there yet. 13.3 percent. Interestingly enough, females 50.8 percent. We're 51 versus 49 percent females and males. Because males tend to do stupid stuff, right? We talked about that with the uh, uh, life expectancy the other day. Uh, in 2011, white people ended up being 78 percent of the population. You got to take this with an asterisk here because it's Hispanic. It is an asterisk. Being Hispanic isn't a race. Like you got white people, but African Americans, you got Asian people. Hispanic isn't there. Hispanic is more of a, yeah, it's, I can't quite, if this is incredible, you have Hispanic center, like right here, white person, etc. Well, that's not what you You can be a white Hispanic at the same time. It really, yeah. so this 70, this 78% white people is going to include the, okay, it's 63% of the white people, 63% of people are white, and then the other, from 63 to 70, whatever that difference is, is Hispanics. But then there's Hispanics that are not white, just like there's Hispanics that are white. So, yeah. Oh, the easiest way, if you look at Brazil, if you've ever seen this, you know, generally the Hispanic, who, who, who we have in Mexico, they all tend to be more white. You go down to, Brazil or somewhere in South America, you got to the. I just had to do the work, but there's different groups there, but they all are technically Hispanic. It's based on back 300 years ago when the white people were coming and they were marrying, it was Indians, Native American, Native, Native South Americans, what do you know? Oh, them, indigenous populations there. You had European, European nurse. You had um, Hispanics, and in different ways, they ended up interacting and having kids, ended up having these mixed groups. So you had white, you had African, you had uh, Hispanic, you had Indian, and then the four of them, the way they crossed over, ended up coming with these subclasses and stuff. And then you start studying the Mexican Revolution, you start studying the Spanish Revolution, and you start bleeding from the eyeballs and all of this stuff, the Haitian Revolution, and then Spanish. That's history lab. Anyway, so white people, I'm gonna go with this one, the 63%. African Americans, 13%. Hispanics passed African Americans a few years ago to be the number, the second largest group in the United States. The Hispanic population and the African American population are both growing faster than a white population. White population is bigger, bigger, but they're growing faster, and what's gonna end up happening in another 20, 30 years? They are going to overtake the white population, and then we're going to end up being 35% Hispanic, 33% African American, 30% white is where we're going to end up being in y'all's lifetime. That's just the way, because if culturally, especially Hispanics tend to have more kids per family, and they have them earlier in life. So they're growing almost exponentially faster. African Americans tend to have more kids per family, and tend to have start having them earlier than white people do. So that's where the game ends up happening. Living in the same house, eighty-four percent of family was. Oh, living in a house for more than one year. Oh, okay. Uh, far more people is twelve point seven percent. High school graduates, eighty-five percent of Americans graduate high school. Only 28% graduate with a master's degree or higher. Guess what? Y'all finish your plans here in another two, three years, and y'all are going to be in the top 30% of Americans when it comes to education. Score. When it comes to education in the county, I'm in the bizarre lane of like the top 2%. I'm telling you that's hard. So, 
Perfect. Um, the mean average travel time to work is 25 minutes. Uh, it's like 30 seconds from my house. Yeah. Um, median household income back then was $52,000 a year. Person per household is an average of two and a half people a year. What? Is that 188? 188. Uh, that's the value of the median, the middle value of houses. It's owner occupied single family households. That not not your vacation home, but this is our garage by the house that you live in. That's where you, you take all of those houses from the forest. The dump in the cardboard box of the, the Bill Gates Mansion, and you find a house in the middle, and that one is worth $188,000. I've mentioned this website before, factfinder.census.gov. Beautiful website. That's where those statistics came from, and there's a bunch more that you can use in research projects in the future. Just remember that one. Excellent. Finally, about three or four years ago, prescription drug overdoses passed car fatalities as being the number one accidental cause of death in the United States. Heart disease, that kind of stuff is not accidental. You kind of brought it on yourself, right? When it comes to accidents, overdoses is an accident. I meant to get high, and I did. I meant to try fast, not crash. Okay. Here you go. I still I need to do the research on this. Single men live longer than married men. What? Less stress. <laughs> I don't know. Married women live longer than single women. Well, the well, I, the, the, the married woman is going to outlive her husband, and she's going to be a widow at that point. But just that's true. You do being being married is going to you know, being married, settling down, calming down, whatever. You're going to you know, live off of somebody. And what? Temperature would be whatever, whatever. It works for women, but for whatever reason, it doesn't work so well for men. I don't know. Yes. Um, just because when I'm single, I can just lay around like Jeff with a hut on the couch and watch TV all day. Now I've got a honeymoon list every time. I'm on. I was happy to come back to work after Thanksgiving because I that way I didn't have to work so hard. But anyway, I, I, I need to really verify, dig into that stat. At some point, I will. But anyway. So that's just a little bit more random stuff. We'll maybe get more random again next week.